What is it about spin that's so fascinating? I think the ability to be able to get the ball to behave uh, when it lands obviously shows your control as a, as a player. Um, practical terms, I don't think it's really that important to be able to generate a lot of spin because you can kind of strategize around what you can and can't do. But the fascination is still there. So today in the video, I'm going to go through a few logical options to try and increase and decrease spin at your own will. Okay, quick crash course in spin. Now, get the basics out of the way first. Good golf ball, clean club, fresh face, you know, not extremely worn across the impact area. Clean grooves. Okay, premium golf ball is an absolute must. You can't do it with a mid-range or a low-range ball. It's, it's never gonna happen, so don't even attempt it. So once you've got the obvious basics out of the way, we need to start to look at the mechanics a little bit. Now, I'm not gonna go overboard in this. We don't need to go deep into the science. You need to just understand a few crucial elements. First one, spin loft, right? Uh, a term coined by Trackman, very, very useful. It really identifies the difference between loft presented at impact, so dynamic loft, and the attack angle, so the trajectory the club is traveling on in a 2D sense from your viewpoint. So attack angle, loft, spin loft. If your spin loft is low, driver, you're gonna spin the ball the least. As that increases and spreads out, the spin increases and increases and increases. Now, it gets to the point where there is too much, and then the ball starts to skid and slip and slide up the face and it pops up. Okay, so key to generating spin is optimizing your spin loft. It's gonna be different player to player. You know, we all deliver the club in slightly different ways. Lofts change at different rates through impact, and that has an influence on spin also. Ultimately, you're trying to get the club to grab on the club face. So we're trying to create some friction. Friction equals spin. If you can add speed in there as well, spin ramps up even more. So let's go through the basics. So we'll start messing around with loft delivered impact first of all. As a gauge, obviously I have a camera behind the hole there that you can see. As a gauge, we'll start with my basic shot and just see how it reacts on the green. Okay, a bit short, pretty flat bounce, rolled out maybe 10, 12 feet. Now, the most simple way, obviously, to increase loft is to change my address position. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take the club face from 12 o'clock, I'm gonna move it to 12.30. Make the same motion, right? So I have more loft on the club at address. If I make the same motion, I'm gonna have more loft on the club at impact. And what I'm gonna do is ball by ball, increase, increase, increase. I'm gonna see when it starts to slip. Very dry conditions, obviously very, very conducive to spin. I should be able to open up and add a decent amount of loft to it. So 12.30 on the face, gonna try and keep the technique as close as I can. Okay, quite a difference there. So you see the ball flew a little bit further, pulled up within a couple of feet. Let's go a little bit more. So we're gonna go one o'clock. So see, it's quite an angle. Shoelace is undone. I'll uh, fix that in a moment, make sure I don't trip over, kids. Okay, one o'clock. Try and keep the technique the same. I'm gonna to have to ramp up the speed bit by bit. Ultimately, I am delivering more loft. That's gonna drop the ball speed down a little bit, but you're not gonna see the flight go up an awful lot, and that's because of the friction I'm creating. Okay, the friction pulls the flight down. One o'clock on the face, lie, I think is decent. A little bit further right, but I think that's loaded. It actually took a firm bounce. What you can't account for, definitely stopped quicker than the first ball, didn't slip up the face. Let's go even further. Let's try and get a little bit of slip on there. Obviously there's a bit of variability ball to ball. The spot you land on is gonna have an influence. You might hit a soft spot occasionally. Let's go really open. So this face is actually gonna look pretty flat this way. Clock face wise, uh, close on two o'clock, I would say. Maybe 1.30, I'm expecting slip on this. If this doesn't slip, it's gonna be absolutely loaded. But I think we're right on breaking point. Let's check it out. Uh, 
up the face. Now, stop quickly, but why did it stop quickly? Land angle, as much as anything else. There wasn't increase in spin. Um, it wasn't sexy at all. It didn't come in, take one hop and grab. It just went up, came down, landed pretty soft. So first point of call, loft at address. Keep it as simple as you can. Now we're gonna move on into path and face-to-path -path relationship. Right, gather up the balls. Let's look at path and face-to-path -path specifically. I try and deliver a fairly neutral club path with my stock shots. If I shift that path to the left, I will generally generate more spin without doing much with the face angle. Okay, face at target, it would twist it slightly open to the path, but we're not adding a great deal of loft. Okay, but if I cut across it, I'm generally gonna spin it more than if I shift the other way and draw it. Why is that? Well, a couple of things. First off, when I aim left and I cut across, my attack angle generally will be a little bit steeper. So anything that gets trapped between club and ball is gonna be reduced. Okay, and the face ultimately is still open to the path, but it's a little bit less this way, a little bit more this way. So I'm still stretching out the spin loft to a degree. If I shift it the other way and go draws, I'll usually come in a little bit shallower. Now shallower can be good for spin, as long as it results in a low face contact. If shallow doesn't result in low face contact, there's a lot of debris gonna get trapped in between, spin's gonna come off. Then you add in the face being slightly close to the path, that spin loft is gonna come down this way. So I'll hit a couple of cuts, I'll hit a couple of draws, and we'll just check out the difference. So I'm gonna go face pretty square to target, aim everything slightly left, and look to just hit a small cut, see the ball spinning right, see what outcome I can get. Oh, that popped up on me. Right, it's gonna stay in. I'm not gonna cut that out. That is as much a lie as anything else. You can see the ground kind of exploded, popped up, loads of debris in between. You put that down as a big fail. Let's go again. May have been a little bit too steep for the ground. That's better. All right, decent stopping power on there. I'm a bit wary on this ground and how soft it is to cut it much more than that, but I'm just gonna ramp it up a notch. I mean, why not? Practice grounds are for fun, right? And experimenting. So we're gonna go a little bit more cut. Feels like 10 degrees out to win, maybe more. The key here is to keep the loft consistent and really move across it. Nice, so that was loaded. I wouldn't want to go much more than that because it feels like I'm swinging 30 yards left of the target. Let's shift the other way and see what kind of outcome we can get. So we're gonna go small draw. Again, I'm gonna see the ball spinning right to left. I'm gonna close things up, keep the face square to target. I'm not gonna roll it specifically. I'm just gonna try and keep it square, change the least I possibly can. Little draw. Almost missed the green. Definitely shifted it right. Now, hopefully you've seen that dive left. There was a lot of hook spin on it, but it did release out a good, a good 10 feet. Let's go with the extreme. I managed to aim that just a little bit better. You see it a little bit more. Wow, this is tricky. This is not, this is not my cup of tea, but let's go. Let's do it. Similar. Not spinning left as hard, but definitely feeling like it's going this way. Kind of tumbling forward towards target a little bit more. So a reduction in spin is certainly possible by shifting path right and drawing it in. You'll see from the other camera, it's a little bit flatter. Um, certainly very different behavior on the first bounce. Let's move into the next option. And then as we move through the options, things become more and more risky. Okay, so we're going a little bit more skill specific. This might not be in your locker. Let's talk through it and you can decide. Right, so we've covered loft at address. We've looked at path and face to path. Now we're gonna go into the slightly more mechanical side of things, and that's changing loft through impact. Right, what I mean by that is, how quickly does the club head overtake my hands into and through impact? Does it stay constant this way, or does it change rapidly? Do I add loft quickly? A little bit of confusion in this area, and rightly so, because it's very difficult to quantify and prove. But as a generalization, it may seem, well, subjective, because it, it is. I see players spin the ball a lot that change the loft quickly through impact. Okay, it's just a 
general subjective take that I have. Versus players that have a very constant loft that doesn't do a lot through the impact zone. I generally see less spin from those players. So we'll have a look at it. I'm going to go with quite a quick overtaking rate. That's what we'll call it. It's how fast the club goes past my hands. And in the follow through, you'll see it'll be very, very narrow. The faster I overtake, the more narrow that'll get because I'm adding loft more quickly. If I didn't add it as quickly, it'd get wider. Didn't change it at all, it'd be much wider. If I held it off, it'd be even wider still. So how wide the arc of the follow through is, is a good indicator of how quickly you overtake. I'm going to do it from square because I don't want the other variables to interfere. And we'll see what we get. So I'm going to ramp up the overtaking rate a little bit. I'm going to go to, a, first of all, a point I'm relatively comfortable with and nothing too crazy. Because as this ramps up, it becomes harder to coordinate and get the result. Now it's struck pretty nice. And generally what it gives me a feeling of is much cleaner contact. And that there has to be a friction element to it also. Let's go a little bit more. You know, I have, I have no fear on a practice ground whatsoever of pushing things to the point where it breaks. Okay, to the point where I do miss hit it. It does, doesn't upset me, doesn't bother me. It's not gonna affect my confidence going forwards. All it does is lets me know the limits of my range of ability at that given time. Okay, don't be scared of screwing up on a practice ground. That's what it's for. So we're gonna ramp this up a little bit more. You might notice a little bit more loading going back because that allows me to unload quicker. If I go super wide going back and unload fast, I'm gonna deliver way too much loft and compromise my low point control. So square face, pretty stark, but we're gonna go with quicker overtaking again. Just hit that too hard. I mean, that did stop pretty rapid, but that first bounce, first bounce was firm and it shot forward, just flew a little bit too far. Let's see if we can get the same and land it in the same kind of spot as the other golf balls, just for scientific purposes. I've hit it too hard again. Oh, have I? Nope, just, it definitely flew further, but you'll have seen it grabbed pretty quick again. Now. We've gone through three different areas that you can tweak around and change for your spin rates. What happens if you start to put them together? Well, things get more risky, all right? You really need to make your choice based on what you feel you can do. So loft address is a really easy, gentle starting point. Path a little bit more tricky um, because your start line may be compromised. Attack angle changes. You know, if I get too draw biased and too shallow, I tend to bottom out a little bit early. Then the overtaking really is a case of, can I coordinate this? What happens if you put them together though? So we're gonna go loft at address, a little bit open, let's say 12.30. We're gonna go a little bit left aim and quick overtaking. So that is all three bottles of medicine thrown into the mix. If I get it right, I should generate a hell of a lot of spin. If I get it wrong, I'm probably not even gonna be putting for my next shot. Okay, but now's the time to do it. 12.30, cut, quick overtake. Hopefully grab the golf ball, get it to spin. Popped up, popped up. Ah, you see it start to tumble towards the hole. Didn't get it. So ultimately there I've delivered too much spin loft because the lie was good, strike was okay just popped on me, so overdone. So I, I really broke the barrier there. Let's try again. Popped up again. See it just go forwards. There's a lesson to be learned here. All right, so I'm gonna actually tweak it down a little bit. I'm gonna change one of the variables. I'm gonna go loft address and leave it relatively square. I'm still gonna cut it. I'm still gonna overtake quickly. Okay, so I'm trying to just bring that spin loft down enough so it doesn't slip and doesn't pop. And the way to do that is to remove, remove sorry, variable, variable by variable, word salad. Here we go. There you go. Nice, just pulled a little bit slightly, but came in nice and flat. Plenty of spin. Final ball, I think. 
Gonna go square face again, maybe a touch open, not much. Little cut, bit of overtaking. Ah, and he's Mr. Green. And that is where you cut. Right, hopefully you've taken a little bit from today's video. Obviously there's gonna be stuff coming forward, so please subscribe and like it if you can. From here, get out and start spinning the ball. Practice ground first, then when you're comfortable, take it onto the course.